So, dear colleagues, I think we can start. We can start, and uh, it's my pleasure, it's my honor and privilege to introduce, well, uh, to introduce uh, Professor uh, Cecilia Pennaccini. Uh, Cecilia is a full professor of cultural anthropology and director of the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography at the University of Turin in Italy. And uh, Cecilia is a very well known, I should say, renowned uh, specialist in uh, an anthropology and history of East Africa, particularly of the Great Lakes region. And uh, so, of course, we, 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 we planned that Cecilia would come to Moscow and uh, would be with us here, but because of the COVID situation, to our great pity, we, uh, she couldn't make this trip, but we hope to see her in Moscow next time on another occasion. And uh, now we should be grateful to the possibility to communicate via Zoom. And uh, Cecilia will uh, read, will deliver three lectures today, tomorrow, and on the 26th of October. And uh, the topic of her today's lecture is uh, the religious landscape of the Great Lakes Africa. Uh, plus to this, well, uh, we have circulated uh, a link to the film uh, titled Kampala Bubble, uh, the film by Cecilia, which is uh, on the same topic actually. And I hope that most of us have uh, watched it in advance. So, well, after the lecture, we will have a chance to ask questions and to concerning both the film and the lecture, and then discuss them both. So and now I'm great to, I'm glad to uh, pass the floor to Cecilia. So Professor Cecilia Pinacin, you are most welcome. Uh, please unmute yourself. Cecilia, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Yes. Now can you hear me? Yes, now it's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri, and thank you to everybody. Um, Dimitri kindly invited me uh, to Moscow for a visiting fellowship, and it's very unfortunate that uh, we couldn't make it because of COVID, but uh, we managed to have the lectures on Zoom, at least, so we can uh, go on with our program somehow. So I thank very much Dimitri Bondarenko and also Maria Aksenova for the organization of the trip that could not uh, take place, but also for the events uh, of today and tomorrow. So um, the first two lectures that I propose you uh, are strictly connected with my ethnography, with, with the ethnographic field work I carried out in the Great Lakes uh, region uh, of Africa. Uh, the third one will take place on Tuesday and uh, will uh, we'll, uh, touch the topic of museums, ethnographic museums, and uh, more specifically, the Museum of uh, Anthropology and Ethnography that I direct here in Torino, which is a closed museum, but gave us some uh, ideas about the, the problems connected to the present anthropological museology, which are quite interesting, I think. So maybe I start with my PowerPoint. I try to, to uh, share it. Uh, Tell me if you can see it. Yes, we could see it. Good, so, okay. Uh, so I would like to start telling you something about my research and how I could uh, carry out uh, ethnographic fieldwork for quite a long time now, because I started in 1988 for my thesis, and then I could continue to go to Africa always in this 
uh, area, so in the Great Lakes region, thanks to the support of this uh, research group, which is called the Italian Ethnological Mission in Equatorial Africa, which is supported by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I directed the mission from 2005 to 2019. And uh, I started in Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, working among a Bantu speaking group called the Banande. Uh, then for my doctoral research, uh, I decided to change the, the, the context, the field, because in the 90s, uh, Congo was uh, in, a, in a dramatic situation because of the war. So I went to Burundi and I uh, focused on the religious tradition of Burundi, but suddenly in 90, uh, 1992, a coup d'etat uh, put Burundi also in an impossible situation. And so I shift to Tanzania in the Kagera region, so Northwestern Tanzania, where the same cult that I was starting to study in Burundi was practiced. Uh, how I, I reached Tanzania? Um, when it was impossible to, to, to work in Burundi, um, I started to make some archival uh, research in the White Father Missionary Archive in Rome. In Italy, we, we are lucky because we have a lot of missionary congregations archive who are really precious for the sources on, on, on Africa. And there I met a young uh, African uh, seminarist who was in Rome to study to become a priest. And he was from Bukoba, from Tanzania. And so he told me that this cult, which is called Kubanda, as, as, a Kubandwa, as you will see, is widely practiced also in Tanzania. So I started to realize that study, studying religions, traditional African religions, uh, should be carried out in a regional perspective because religion is not never confined in a single ethnic context, but uh, it tends to overcome boundaries and borders. So I went to Bukoba, uh, I carried out uh, my doctoral research there and from there to Uganda, where also the cult is, uh, uh, is practiced. So in Uganda, uh, we develop our uh, collective research under the, the support of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We signed a cooperation agreement between the University of Turin and Makerere University, which is one of the oldest and the, the most prestigious university in East Africa. Um, the agreement promotes uh, research as well as a didactic cooperation between the two universities. And in 2016, the European Union opened the Erasmus program, that is the most important mobility program for European uh, university students, open it to Sub-Saharan Africa. So I immediately applied for a program and we have been financed since uh, 2016. So the European Union uh, support the mobilities of students, master students and PhD students from Uganda to Italy and from Italy to Uganda, as well as teachers and uh, researchers. So this is the framework, the institutional framework uh, uh, where my, my research um, have been carried out for now more than 30 years. <laughs> I should say. Uh, and this, just to give you an idea, is uh, one of the first group of Ugandan students uh, who were trained uh, at Makerere. And some of them, there are also colleagues, are part of our research equipe. So 
the research I'm presenting you today uh, are very much carried out in a cooperative framework with Ugandan colleagues, which I think is a very important aspect of, of what we, we are trying to do. So we focus on the Great Lakes region. It is a region uh, located at the equatorial latitude. Uh, it is uh, uh, included uh, between the, the uh, elongated lakes uh, on the Western Rift, Tanganyika, Kivu, Edward and Albert and Victoria Lake. Is, uh, it is uh, a, a land uh, of a certain altitude. Uh, you know that uh, Lake Victoria is already located at uh, 1,200 meters on, on sea level. And then the altitude uh, grow towards the mountains on the west where the Rovenzori Massif has a peak of 5,000 and almost 200 meters. So a very high land, uh, which is now shared between five post-colonial nations, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, but uh, still maintain a certain in homogeneity under a cultural point of view. The Belgian anthropologist Luc de Hoche used to speak about the uh, uh, interlacustrian civilization, la civilisation interlacustre. Uh, so he thought that there were a unique civilization in the Great Lakes region. And uh, even if uh, we can see there are more than 20 different language groups, it is clear that many aspects of the culture is uh, widely shared. Uh, so as a methodological premise, I, I told you that uh, I was almost obliged to change the, my fieldwork because of uh, what was happening there. But at the end, I think that I was lucky because I realized that uh, it was very important to adopt a regional approach and not an ethnic uh, approach to the study of these uh, groups. And uh, for me, it was very useful to read the books of Jean-Luc Amsel, the French uh, ethnologist, who published many books, especially Au Cœur de l'Ethnie. I think some of them are also translated in English. Connection, Logique Métis, showing that uh, uh, anthropologists should abandon the old mono-ethnic approach, choosing a sort of topological anthropology. So to study spaces and all different interactions which happen in these spaces. And for me, interaction based on religion were at the center of the core of my, of my research. Um, I'm looking at the time because I don't want to be too, too long. So uh, just uh, as, a, as a brief introduction to the region, as we, we saw the combination of the altitude uh, end of the latitude of the region produce a very, uh, a very um, good weather. It is a very rainy uh, region. So cultivation is very much possible and also uh, pastoralism. So the economy since a long time ago is based on the combination of the agriculture and the, the pastoralism. And this uh, uh, a quite extraordinary uh, economic uh, organization also, uh, it is very important in the social hierarchy and in the, in the political dimension, we will see it. Um, so this uh, 
very lucky environment, uh, gave birth to many different societies, which around the 14th century uh, gave uh, rise, uh, gave born to kingdoms. So we have centralized societies that emerge around the 14th centuries and then spread all over the region. Kingdoms, the interlacustin kingdoms. You see here on the map the most important kingdoms, Bunyoro in the north, which is the first one who uh, who was uh, founded, and then Buganda, Busoga, and then uh, Rwanda, Burundi, and other petty kingdoms, uh, which. Uh, came on the on the in the area uh, in the following centuries. Um, this emergence of the kingdoms uh, it is connected with many factors, of course, with economic factors, with the possibility of producing a lot of food through agriculture, agriculture as you, you have seen in, in this picture, is based now on the staple food, which is a different kind of banana, musa, uh, that have been imported from Indonesia, probably around the ninth century, and on an extensive pastoralism. Uh, the very specific uh, uh, solution of this economy is the uh, differentiated um, attitude of the population. So group of agriculturists are quite rigidly separated but by groups of uh, pastoralists. Pastoralists are called Bahima or Batuzzi, Bahima in the northern part of the region, Batuzzi in the southern. Agriculturalists are called Bayeru in the northern part and Bahutu in the southern part. Uh, all around the region, you can also find a group of Pygmies called Batwa or Baswa. In the kingdoms, uh, sorry, in the kingdoms, uh, these different social groups, or we can also call them occupational classes are amalgamated in an extraordinary way. So each one do uh, their own uh, productions, but they, uh, they coexist in the same political, cultural, and also religious communities. So uh, we know that uh, from a long time ago, even studying uh, linguistic and oral tradition, as well as David Schoenbrunn uh, did in, in his wonderful research, that this uh, political and religious feature are very ancient and uh, go, um, go back towards the 14th, 15th centuries. We should uh, ask, uh, to ourselves, what, uh, which were the political organization before the kingdoms, and uh, we know, sorry, that the societies uh, uh, before the 14th centuries were based on a clan organization, uh, patrilineal exogamic uh, clans, totemic clans. Uh, that recognize themselves in a vegetal or animal speeches called uh, okuziro in the local languages that mean uh, the speeches that is forbid to eat or even to have contacts. Uh, these clans, these agnatic, agnatic groups were mobile, probably mobile, they, they, they travels on the land. And they practice the cult, the cult of Misambwa, uh, natural spirits. They had the shrines. Many of these shrines are still there, are still maintained by specialists and mediums. And they are normally located in very impressive, beautiful 
natural spots like uh, waterfalls or mountains, very ancient trees, where uh, till today uh, people go to practice the cult and probably the, uh, the feeling of being inside the nature uh, help them to come out from their daily life and be in touch with the spirits and with the spiritualities. Something that is not very far from what Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, called this, the feeling of the sublime. And uh, we will see some pictures later. Uh, these are very beautiful spots. We know that in the 14th centuries, the kingdoms started. Tomorrow, I would like to speak about the organization of the kingdoms and the role of gender, the role of women inside the kingdoms, because it's, it's very interesting. But what is interesting for the history of religion in the Great Lakes region is that um, uh, at the moment when the kingdoms emerge, also the religion found an institutionalized form. So what it is now called the Kubandwa mediumship cults uh, started to have a more precise, a more re, uh, institutionalized um, organization. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, page, I just summarized the different historic uh, steps of the evolution of the religion. Uh, the, the religious landscape changed dramatically with the arrival of uh, the Arabs uh, around 1840, and then with the arrivals of the Europeans and the beginning of evangelization uh, around 1870, 1880, uh, sorry, 1970, 1980. Uh, and then, many different changes uh, continue during the colony and after independence, reaching a situation now which is very, very complex and very rich. If you have seen the film, I think you, you perceived how rich is the, is the religious landscape. But now I would like to talk a bit about the traditional cult, with cult which is still practiced widely. Kubandwa is a Bantu term, uh, is a verb, as you can see from the prefix ku. Uh, band is a, a common Bantu uh, root, which means to e exercise oppression. So the passive form, Kubandwa, means to be pressed from outside. Uh, and it is a metaphor used to describe spirit possession, the idea of a, of a spirit which enter in the body, enters in the body of the, of, of the medium uh, and speak through the medium. Mediums are called embandwa, mandwa, which are also connected with this root. Uh, you can find this root also, for example, in a, a term used in Brazil to call some Afro-Brazilian religion, Umbanda, is the same root, and probably the Umbanda cults come from central Congo, uh, uh, originating in the Great Lakes region. So it is an historical uh, path that we can follow through language, through linguistic uh, sources. And uh, um, the mediums, the mbandwa, the mandwa, are possessed by different categories of spirits. Uh, the most famous, uh, the, 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 the most important uh, pantheon of spirits is referred to the bachuesi. The bachuesi is a very famous myth uh, in, uh, known in, uh, in, in the entire region. Uh, referring to a mythological Kitara empire, which is uh, considered at the origin of the, of the kingdoms. So the practice that uh, is, is uh, still uh, widely uh, present in the region um, is uh, 
um, carried by mediums like this woman that you see in the photo. They know techniques of trance. They get into trance only by music using uh, percussion instruments like the rattle that you can see in her hand during rituals uh, when they transform themselves in the spirits of heroes and of deceased kings and heroine as well. Uh, so uh, through trance, they become kings somehow and they can speak for these kings of the past. And uh, we can say that the spirits of the deceased kings continue to reign uh, in the present through the institution of mediumship. And these are pictures of some of the mediums I, I have uh, worked with during my research. I collected uh, a lot of different story, life histories of mediums. Uh, there is a precise uh, path, a precise uh, uh, way to become a medium. Normally, uh, mediums tell that everything started through a disease. They uh, manifested sort of initiated disease, sometimes during infancy when they were children, uh, with some symptoms that are quite recognizable. They started to uh, lose the capacity of speaking, of being uh, understood by the family. They needed to escape from the domestic space, maybe uh, naked, uh, um, go to they they used to go and spend long time in the forest or in the uh, um, space that they call Irungu, that is the the place for wild animals, and uh, in this way they manifested a sufferance because the presence of the spirits inside their body before initiation, it is perceived as a disease. Then when the symptoms uh, are recognized, recognized as a sign of possession, these people that are men or women, uh, they go through an initiation which is organized in three phases. The first phase is, is a, a period of segregation. They spend sometimes months living in the banana plantation around the house where they are fed uh, uh, like animals. They live uh, in, a, in a quite uh, animal state. So their status is degraded in this period. Then, uh, a celebration, a rite is organized by the uh, old mediums of the area and uh, they receive the objects, the uh, dresses uh, and uh, all the paraphernalia of the, um, of the mediums. Uh, and this is the second phase after that, the, there will be a sort of procession to a natural spot because this uh, natural spot are still very important in the cult where they are declared new mediums. They swear, they, they um, uh, tie themselves to the medium communities. So after this, they become, uh, they can start to work as a mediums with the communities. What is their work? It is mm, mainly to receive uh, sick people or people who needs uh, counseling with their families and their door is always uh, open to anybody who want to consult them. Even people who come from quite uh, far away because uh, the language that they speak is a body language that can be understood by 
anybody and uh, mediums travel in the region as well as patients. So these are the most important feature of this uh, uh, spirit possession cult. And it is still uh, uh, recognizable in the present, but we know that uh, many changes um, were introduced when the when the Europeans arrived in the region. Here you can see uh, John Hanning speak and Grant when they were looking for the Nile sources and they entered in some of the most important capitals of the Great Lakes region. Uh, and uh, here we are in 1862, as you see, and this started a period of uh, very, very important change also at the religious, uh, in the religious organization, because in the pre-colonial time, Kubandwa was not only uh, a private or medicine practice, but it was also very much connected with the political organization of the kingdoms. The mediums played a sort of counterbalance uh, role towards the kings. They were possessed by the spirits of deceased kings, so they were kings uh, in a certain way, and their shrines were considered out of the law of the kings. So uh, mediumships was one of the way used in these uh, interacoustic kingdoms to reach a balance of power, which is very much, uh, which is a very important in, uh, aspect of this uh, political organization. So what happened when the when the, the Arabs arrive and the missionary arrives in, uh, in the, uh, at the mid of, uh, of the 19th centuries. Uh, of course, the missionaries, now I will speak especially about Buganda Kingdom. We will see the organization of the Buganda Kingdom tomorrow, but uh, Buganda uh, was a, quite uh, develop uh, society when the foreigner arrives. Uh, there were a big capital, Kibuga, uh, and the Arabs arrived there as merchants in the fourth, in uh, around 1940, uh, to make commerce, looking for ivory slaves and uh, taking their cottons and firearms. Then uh, the explorers arrived and they called for the missionaries. Uh, the first missionaries arriving there uh, were the British Anglican missionaries from the church uh, missionary society uh, in uh, 1872 followed in 1876 by the Catholic White Fathers. They enter in the capital, uh, sorry, they enter in the capital thanks to the generosity of the king of the Kabaka. The Kabaka was uh, very open to foreigners. And so he gave to the missionaries a hill to leave and to start their activities. Uh, the missionaries uh, didn't only want to evangelize people, they wanted really to enter in the society and to try to change the structure of the society from the interior. So uh, there were a conflict between Anglicans, uh, Catholic, and then also Muslim, so that the capital of Buganda at the, in the last decades of the 18th century became a, a land of conflicts of religious war. And uh, probably the most uh, impressive dramatic episode of this conflict is the 
killing of uh, some probably 50 or 60 pages of the Kabaka, young people who uh, was sent by the clans to live at the court, to live in the palace with the Kabaka, and who also uh, had probably sexual uh, relationship with the Kabaka. Uh, the missionaries, uh, of course, uh, evangelized the pages and then asked to the pages to make a choice between God, between Jesus and the Kabaka. And the Kabaka could not uh, accept this choice. He had, Kabaka Mwanga, had to, uh, to reaffirm his authority and so uh, decided to torture and kill these uh, young boys um, who were then uh, burned in an execution uh, uh, field in Namugongo, where now there is one of the most important Catholic sanctuary in East Africa. So this episode mark really uh, a, a, an important uh, change in the political and the religious life of the kingdom. Uh, it was not possible anymore to practice the old cult and moreover, the relationship between political uh, power and religion was uh, uh, attacked openly by the Europeans. Um, royalty was conceived as a sacralized power. The king, the Kabaka, uh, had in his person a mystical power which came from the ancestors and uh, all the process of sacralization of the person of the king was uh, uh, produced during the rituals, the court rituals, the coronation rituals and also the funerary rituals of the king. So uh, this aspect where uh, were attacked by the missionaries and in this way, they destroyed uh, a very important aspect of the political um, leadership uh, of the kingdom. So they uh, established their centers inside the capital. You see, this is the Catholic cathedral in uh, uh, now what is now Kampala, which is uh, the capital of Uganda built on the last site of the old capital, the Kibuga, the capital, you should uh, know that was uh, a shift every, uh, uh, when the, the king died, the capital was completely destroyed and rebuilt in another place. Another important uh, innovation introduced by Europeans was to fix the capital. So to forbid the shift of the capital. And this is another way to uh, weak the power of the kings because the political power was disseminated in the territory of the kingdom through the shifting of the capital. So to fix the capital was another way to, to weak the power of the, the, the kingdom and also establishing uh, sharp borders that was not uh, easy to, to, to overcome. So the, uh, sorry, the Anglicans also uh, built their own big monuments of uh, power, Namiwembe Cathedral, and then later the Muslim also started to build their uh, mosque. But still, uh, even in this difficult time, uh, the shrines of the spirits of the tradition of the, uh, of the old dynasty remain attended by a lot of people. This is one of the most important sacred spots in uh, Uganda now, Mubende Hill, uh, uh, with this uh, tree which has 600 uh, 
uh, years, and it is known as the uh, capital of the first uh, king of the Kitara Empire, Ndahura. Some archaeological research uh, have been carried out in the area showing that the, 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 the spot is a ritual, uh, a ritual center probably since the 14th century and is still attended as you see in the picture, a medium, this is the medium who was there when I uh, shot the film, you have seen her I think in the film, now she is dead. Uh, she maintained the shrine and she was possessed by the spirit of the um, wife of Daura, Nakaima, who became also an important uh, female uh, figure of the pantheon. So, uh, Kubandua was attacked by the Europeans, the missionaries, but it did not disappear. Um, in uh, 1912, uh, the British that established the protectorate, the protectorate in uh, 1894, in, uh, in 1912, they promulgated the so-called witchcraft ordinance, a law forbidding all type, all kind of magical, but also religious traditional practices in the protectorate. So all religious practices were forbidden with the only exception of herbalism. Why they did uh, so? They did so because uh, uh, the British uh, understood the um, political power of the mediums and also their capacity to counterbalance the political leaders and eventually to critique and to play a political role. So uh, the British were very much um, frightened by the power of the mediums. The very few anti-colonial resistance movement that took uh, place in the region were led by mediums. One very famous uh, revolt was led by a medium in the Rubenzari area in, uh, uh, nine, in the 20s. And uh, this medium, together with two chief of the Baconzo of the um, group in this area, were hanged by the British. So, the witchcraft ordinance had, in my point of view, uh, a political function uh, to put the mediums out of the political life. So uh, while during the pre-colonial time, the mediums were very much part of the kingdoms, uh, during the colonial era, the practice was forbidden. But of course, it did not disappear, but uh, the medium started to practice uh, inside the house during the night, so in a private dimension. They uh, have lost their public dimension. Uh, so the colonial period uh, is a period of peace because the British uh, establish a military peace. They, they succeeded in found a balance in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the colony, uh, transforming the kingdoms uh, for their interest and tolerating somehow the religious practices. Uh, independence, sorry, independence arrived for Uganda in 1962. Uh, and this uh, balance that somehow the colonialists managed to, to establish uh, suddenly uh, break down. So 
before Uganda, a very difficult period started uh, with the dictatorships of Obote and then Idi Amin and uh, all the this, this violence and uh, the destruction of this period, which meant also the abolition of the uh, kingdoms. Uh, Obote abolished the kingdoms in uh, uh, 1966, and the abolition of the kingdoms was really the end of the war for, for the Baganda especially, but generally speaking in Uganda, because it was unconceivable to live in a world where the kings were not there, where the spirits of the kings were not there. So this uh, terrible violent period ended in uh, 1986 when President Yoveri Museveni uh, took the power. And uh, probably the most important, uh, the most important uh, innovation that Museveni took in his government was the restoration of the kingdoms. In 1993, uh, the Museveni government changed the constitution, allowing uh, uh, traditional authorities to be recognized in a cultural form, of course, in a cultural form. So without the use of uh, force, without the army, without economic prerogatives, but the kingdoms, the kings came back. And uh, immediately the, Bukan the Buganda king, the Kabaka was re, uh, restored. And then also the Bunyoro kingdoms came back, the Toro kingdoms and later Busoga and then other new kings, um, even kingdoms that never, have never been there in the area uh, came in the political arena because the, the royalty is one of the form that the political life in Uganda take place. So with the kingdoms, uh, the mediums uh, of the traditional religion uh, also came back. Um, yes, then you will see. Uh, so what happened after 1993 is that the the shrines uh, came back to their old uh, aspects. The mediums find again their dignity to practice openly in, in the day. And it is a sort of revival, uh, revival phenomenon. So uh, Kubandwa was rediscovered and probably also reinvented uh, as a form of continuity with the pre-colonial past, which is a very important need that uh, people feel in the area. So as you have seen in the films, the, the religious landscape became very complex. Uh, the Catholic, and this is uh, the, the, the Virgin statue from the Rubaga Cathedral on the modern, landscape of Kampala uh, are there. The Anglican are still very powerful, but also the Muslim are an important part of, uh, of uh, Uganda population. And as you can see, the symbols of the Muslim, Muslim religion is also very visible in the urban landscape. This is the big mosque, which was built by Gaddafi, uh, in the 90s, uh, which is also very much part of the political life. Uh, and uh, uh, also the Indians took uh, their different cults, different religions, Hinduism, Sikhs. And then the new Christians, which now became in the 90s, a very important uh, part of religious life, Pentecostalism, which uh, is uh, somehow the new uh, form of Christianity, uh, 
uh, read in a sort of African uh, new form, which is spread all over uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is, uh, became one of the most important fate. So even thanks to the sort of uh, destructurated organization of Pentecostal church, because uh, there is no hierarchy, so anyone can declare himself or herself a pastor to start a community, to build a church, and to uh, born again, as they say, in Jesus. Um, the Pentecostals, now they are uh, around 15% of the population uh, declared to, to, to be part of the Pentecostal movements. They are also very interesting because uh, they use new uh, in, uh, innovative technological way to communicate. And uh, here I would like to, to uh, spend some words on the media of religion because uh, Kubandwa, as uh, you have seen, uh, is based on a form of communication with uh, spirits. Um, uh, completely um, based on the body language, music, dance, and uh, spirit possession. Uh, when, the, when the missionaries arrive, they introduce the real religion of the books, and uh, in order to convert people, Muslim before and, uh, and uh, Christian later, in order to convert people, they had to introduce writings. So writing has been introduced in the region by missionaries and first by Arabs uh, as a means of conversion. It was not uh, possible to convert people without uh, teaching them how to read, maybe not to write, but to read. So. So uh, the religious uh, media change uh, dramatically from spirit possession, from body languages to writing. Then what, happening, what is happening now among the Pentecostal is a new different uh, form of communication. They use very much the, the new technology of communication, so audiovisual, TV channels and also um, social social media. So somehow they overcome writing and they uh, uh, found again the way of using the body language, but um, uh, transmitting it through the technology, the digital technology of, of new media. And this, I think, is also an interesting aspect. Uh, there are TV channels where uh, mass uh, functions, religious functions are transmitted all over the world or in mass uh, uh, rituals and ceremonies uh, that are attended in, in different ways. So I think that this, uh, um, landscape, religious landscape change in uh, five centuries through uh, different steps that I tried to, to describe. But what uh, is, is very interesting at the moment is the uh, peaceful, tolerant atmosphere, which you can uh, breathe in uh, Uganda, generally speaking, in the, in the Great Lake region regarding religion. In a region that had very, very dramatic conflicts, religion seems to play um, a, a, a role of putting the groups together beyond difference of languages, of social status, of gender, as we will see tomorrow. 
And this is very much also thank due to the law, to the constitution, uh, which allow this freedom of practice and allow also uh, different kinds of marriages, monogamy, polygamy, depending on the faith that each one want to practice. So I think I would like to end now, if it's fine, uh, Dimitri, to leave uh, the, the time for maybe some debates, even on the films, on, 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 the, on the lecture and on the films that also integrate what I tried to say today. Well, yes, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And uh, actually, we can uh, begin uh, with uh, uh, not, maybe not with comments, but maybe with some questions uh, concerning your uh, talk or the film. So anyone is uh, welcome to to take the floor, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your presentation uh, for your film. It was really interesting and. Could you explain more about, uh, as you told, uh, in uh, Buganda Kingdom, uh, Catholic and Protestant world, and uh, what was the main difference in the attitude toward evangelization of African people and uh, toward uh, traditional African beliefs between Catholic and Angl Anglicans? Excuse me, can you repeat? Because I couldn't get clearly your question. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, as you said, uh, in uh, Buganda Kingdom, Catholic and Protestant mission worked. So could you tell more about uh, the attitude uh, toward uh, evangelization of African people? What was the main difference? Okay, the difference is between Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. Let me ask. Yes. yes. Yes, of course. So, uh, at the beginning of the colony, of the protectorate, the majority uh, of Christians were Anglicans. Uh, and the political life of the, of the colony was very much uh, um, related to difference and conflicts between Catholic and Protestant. So I think that uh, there are differences in the liturgy, and these are quite important because as you know, the Protestant liturgy is uh, uh, colder, if I can use this mm -hmm. term, than the Catholic one. And uh, this was probably a problem during evangelization because uh, uh, this liturgy is very far from the religious experience that people used to have in traditional practices. On the contrary, Catholics probably left more space to music, to um, some more expressive uh, behaviors. Then you should also consider that uh, um, some uh, renovation movements uh, start also inside the church. Uh, the revival movement, the East African revival movement started uh, in Kenya and then spread also in Uganda trying to Africanize a bit the Christian practices. Uh, because, of course, uh, they were, I think, perceived as, as quite uh, far away from the experience of communicating with the spirits that they have uh, uh, at home. But the Pentecostal made the change. So, uh, uh, I think that the, the reason of, of the fortune of the Pentecostal church uh, lies in some similarities between spirit possession 
in the image of the Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit descending in the body of the faithful, um, which is seen as quite uh, comprehensible, more comprehensible by the, by the people. So uh, Pentecostalism is a sort of uh, African, there is seen as an African um, reinterpretation of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ludomir, uh, you raised your hand. Right, I, uh, I did. Yeah, um, uh, thank, thank you, Dimitri. Um, very interesting presentation. Um, I don't know much about Africa, where especially this area I've visited several times, but never as anthropologist. So uh, um, I have a question about uh, no, the kingdoms that you mentioned. Uh, uh, but I, I, I understand you will be discussing the kingdoms tomorrow uh, in some details. But uh, so, so um, uh, my first question about kingdoms, kingdoms was uh, about the structure, but I will wait till tomorrow with this question. Now I want to clarify what you had mentioned uh, during your speech. Um, uh, uh, the revival of the kingdoms, um, does it mean that they are just now their official administrative units uh, in, in the country or, or they, they exist as other political entities? Um, well, what is the status of those kingdoms? And, and the second question, mm, uh, I, it's very, it was very interesting in the beginning of, of your presentation uh, you mentioned, <clears throat> uh, oh, that's what I understood from this slide, that uh, th 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 there is a correlation between uh, political change and religious change. And, uh, in other words, every time we see a new political regime, uh, there is a religious change. Uh, what is causing what? Is, 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 uh, is the political change introducing the... Uh, New religion, or 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 religion is uh, um, associated with uh, new political ideology that is coming in. No. If you could address this briefly, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting questions. Yes, tomorrow I will try to give some information about the structure of the kingdoms. Of course, I won't have too much time, but uh, um, it is important uh, at least to, to give some ideas to understand uh, which is the role of gender in the, in the kingdoms, because in these uh, African kingdoms, women play the political role. And so, but it is the topic of tomorrow. But so, uh, you ask about the, the restoration of the kingdoms. The, the Uganda constitution uh, promulgated in 93 uh, has an article recognizing the traditional authorities uh, in a cultural form. So kingdoms exist, uh, but uh, exist as cultural entities. Uh, they cannot... Uh, uh, have uh, a, a budget, an economic budget, so they, they work through private foundations and they cannot play openly a political role in the Ugandan democracy because it is a democracy in parliament, uh, but they can play cultural, uh, a cultural role celebrating rituals, organizing uh, initiative, different initiatives. Um, what's, what's happened is that the kingdoms play actually a role in the political arena, a very important one, um, in a sort of, uh, of uh, hide, hiding a bit this, this problem, but constantly there is a conflict between the central governments and the kingdoms. 
uh, it, it's as uh, I imagine, yes. Yes, I, I was there. It happened many times, even quite harsh and violent conflicts. I was in uh, Kampala in uh, 2012, I think, and uh, there, there were really, there have been a, a sort of revolt uh, of the Baganda uh, followers of the kings. Uh, was Museveni because uh, Museveni forbids the kings to uh, travel in the kingdom to, 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 to raise taxes. So um, it's a quite complex situation. Uh, but I think that uh, it's impossible in Uganda to control the political prerogatives of the kingdoms. Uh, and since the political arena is so much, uh, arena is so much uh, uh, I mean the, 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 the kingdoms are so much interconnected with the political arena, what happening is then now there are new kingdoms that ask to be recognized even if they never exist in the past, one very interesting. That's, fa that's fascinating. How how the, how can that happen? You know, so so a, a, anyone can come in and look. I'm a king. Recognize. Uh, so <laughs> I studied one case, which is the the Rubenzori movement in the Rubenzori on the mountain. The society was never has never been centralized. They were acephalous groups uh, of uh, mountain agriculturalists. What happened is that during the British uh, the, the occupation, under indirect rule, because the British needed, they, they needed to have kings to, and, and uh, political leaders, local leaders to govern they put the bacons of the people of the mountain under the Torah rule. So they suffered from this uh, uh, domination and they organized themselves in a new kingdom. Uh, they protest, it was the way to protest. And then uh, slowly they arrived to, to gain the recognition of the government. So in uh, 2000, I think the Rubenzori kingdom was recognized by the government because in this way uh, they are, I mean, they, they, they have a strong, stronger position in the nation. They also have some funds, some money, some support. So it is a process, it is a strange process, so how to say but kingdoms are, are raising in Uganda. And the, the second question is also very interesting. Is I think it's very difficult in this kind of society to define separately in a, in a marked way religion and politics. Because this, uh, uh, this political organization were very much Sacralized the, the political power of the king became uh, it was connected to the spiritual dimension. The legitimation of the power were connected to the, the spirit. So uh, obviously, uh, uh, any political change took also some political, some religious change. Uh, the two institutions evolve, transform themselves uh, together somehow. Uh, that's not means that uh, the religious leaders uh, supported necessar necessarily the, the, the political leaders. They could uh, uh, counterbalance them, but it was, can we say, a, a, a religious political system. It was a sort of, uh, in Italy, we call it an historical compromise. 
between the church and the state, something like that. Uh, and somehow it is still like that because Museveni is very much connected with the Pentecostal movements and the, and the, the vote come very much from, from the, the church and the political leaders and the, the religious leaders. So it is an integrated system. <laughs> So do, do, do you see evidence of syncretic religions? Because you have so many yes. different religions uh, in one place. So I can imagine, I, I imagine there will be some sort of syncretic attempts to, to, yes. to fuse some of those religions into more course, complex system. I didn't, to, uh, I didn't have the time to, to describe more, but oh. in, the, in the pantheon, the spiritual pantheon now involved the word I'm speaking about Ubandua, the, the traditional cult. Now you can be possessed by the spirit of the Virgin Mary, by the spirit of Muhammad, by the spirit of the saints. So it is a way to think, conceptualize a change inside from, from, from the, their own way. And on the other hand, uh, uh, Christianity has been Africanized very much, very much. Yeah. And then uh, uh, it's also important to understand that they change uh, religion very easily. So, you know, once I think Dimitri <laughs> knows uh, he knows Africa very well, and the, he, people change. Uh, you no, know, they they are catholic then they become protestant then they go to the mosque it is a, a very fluid situation very open and fluid well thank you I, I would like to add something well to your answers to ludamir's questions on the first question i, I also uh, did some field work in uganda in uh, 2017 and 18 and so i have just recalled several quotations from the interviews of uh, local people. Well, of course, I'm quoting by memory now. Well, uh, as for the number of uh, dignitaries, I liked uh, the words of one of my uh, interviewees. Uh, well, he said, there are so many uh, kings in this country, that's, and some of them are so poor that they do not even have a cause of their own, some of them. So, uh, but in general, in general, the situation in Uganda is typical uh, for Africa uh, from the perspective of the official status of these persons versus their real possibilities in society. Because, uh, well, I uh, did uh, some field work in some other countries like Zambia, like Benin, and uh, notice the scene that officially, officially, well, according to constitutions, well, local uh, kings or chiefs, well, uh, are bound to what, for example, the constitution of Benin calls traditional issues. Traditional issues, so well, uh, whatever this could mean. But of course, everywhere they play a real political role, a real political role. For example, in Nigeria, what I saw when I visited what used to be the independent kingdom of Benin, well, and uh, now it's uh, actually the territory of the other state of Nigeria. No governor could ever be appointed without the consent of the uh, king of Benin, of course. And uh, such people are very powerful politically and economically, many of them. Uh, all over Africa, including Uganda, where, of course, first of all, uh, the king of Buganda is uh, a very influential person. And his, uh, and, and several kingdoms, the biggest kingdoms, including Buganda, first of all, have something like parallel political structures. For example, the uh, Kabaka of Buganda has the parliament of his own, well, uh, the, a gov the government of his own, well, and uh, for example, the building of his, of, of the Buganda parliament is uh, actually comparable in size of, uh, with the national parliament in Kampala. And uh, probably, uh, well, in my view, he may be the second person in influence in the country other than the president, maybe. So 
And the so, so the, there is there is a strong competition, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So 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 those those kingdoms are not just symbolic representation of power. They are real political entities. Well, yes. Uh, well, the uh, extent of their power can be very different because really there are very many <laughs> petty kingdoms, chiefdoms where really, well, their heads do not have. And we'll get to we'll get to typology tomorrow when 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 we yeah. hear about yeah. the structure. So yeah. we'll talk about and just what, more, kingdoms of chiefdoms. Yeah, and two more quotations just to give you an impression of uh, what all this is about. Well, and a very old, over 90, man in the Soga country uh, said, as, as far as I am Musoga, so belong to the Soga nation, as far as I am Musoga, I cannot by, but be uh, a subject of the king of Busoga. It's compulsory. I cannot but be uh, his subject. And one more quotation of a, a man from the Ganda, uh, group, ethnic group. He said, as far as you are, he said to me, as far as you are not a Gandhi, you cannot understand us. But for us, <laughs> but for us, Kabaka, the king, is in our bones and blood. And the president, this is someone whose office was uh, introduced for us by the British. So this is very typical. Well, no, yeah. And as for the yeah. second uh, question, I also wanted to ask Cecilia, uh, about religious syncretism, because uh, referring to a film now, uh, well, which I of course liked, uh, but uh, uh, this is what uh, as I could not find in the film about religious syncretism. There was quite a lot about uh, capitalism, Protestantism, well, uh, including well, born again and so on and so forth, and uh, much uh, attention was paid to the so-called uh, local, or I would like to say, better say, autochthonous uh, beliefs. Well, but uh, about syncretism, of course, and uh, it, it would be very important. And you uh, mentioned, noticed in your uh, table at the beginning of your presentation uh, that uh, syncretism is a, a phenomenon of the post-colonial time, but it may also be important. Probably, as, as we all know, well, in uh, many parts of Africa, for example, in uh, contemporary Angola, well, the DRC, well, uh, the main, in West Africa, uh, on the Guinea coast, uh, well, the main manifestations of religious syncretism, like Kimbangism and others, well, uh, they uh, appeared, uh, they formed yet in the colonial time and had a clear anti-colonial stance sometimes like uh, Kim Bangism, for example. And probably in Uganda, the, as uh, you uh, noted, uh, they formed later, probably because uh, Europeans with Christianity came there later than to any, actually any other part of the continent, right? So uh, uh, thank you. And uh, please colleagues, any other questions for Cecilia? Yes, I'd like to add, uh, Dimitri, uh, regarding what you were telling, I think that uh, you can speak of syncretism. I like also to speak about openness. Uh, I think that the religious uh, system, the pre-colonial religious system, which is also, uh, it, it, how can you say, an ontological system, a way of thinking somehow, is a very open one. So they were ready to integrate uh, what's, what's coming from outside, from abroad. Um, even because uh, it is a, a, a can, can we say, a polytheistic system. So uh, in a pantheon, which is so big, which is, can, is able systematically uh, program to integrate uh, powers coming from outside, because uh, we should also remember that uh, uh, the origin, we will see it tomorrow, the origin of the kingdoms, the mythological uh, uh, 
the legends regarding the origin of the kingdoms uh, come from outside. The, the first king was a foreign. And this idea of uh, uh, putting in relation uh, foreigners and, uh, and uh, the community and uh, integrating what, what's coming from outside is, is, is a very important uh, feature of the system. So when the Arabs and the Christian arrived, I think there were, it was not a big problem to integrate these new gods in the system. The problem was for the missionary because they, they, they conceived the, the religion as a matter of conversion. Yeah, absolutely. But Africans, they, they, they don't really convert. I mean, they integrate new uh, entities, but they still, of course, they continue to practice their sacrifice to the family ancestors. How can you avoid to do this? Even if the missionaries uh, started a, a, a very violent uh, campaign to demonize demonizing the spirit of the ancestors. But I, I continue to see even in the Christian house, there, there is always a, a small shrine for the elders and you could sacrifice there. And I think it's, 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 it's impossible to, to eradicate this. So they, find the, they found the way to put everything together. And this That's I think true. is wonderful. <laughs> That's true. And you, you are right that they change religions easily. Well, mm -hmm. during my field work, yes, I uh, worked with a group of Russian old believers. Russian, I mean, not in, of course, in ethnic term, but uh, belonging to the Russian church. Yes. Well, and of course, uh, all of them, except uh, the youngest, uh, converted to this new for them uh, brand of Christianity from uh, either Islam or uh, Pentecostalism or uh, Anglicanism or Catholicism or from the Greek uh, brand of uh, Orthodox Christianity. And they do not see it as a problem. Uh, I, I, among them, there were people for whom uh, this religion was not the second, but even the third or the fourth in their life. But uh, on the other hand, uh, in my view, we should not, at the same time, exaggerate uh, these uh, uh, aspects uh, of uh, double belief, beliefs, uh, well, uh, th not syncretism even, but uh, syncretism is something when, uh, as a mixture of, for example, Christianity and local beliefs, uh, we have some, we get something, uh, well, new. But I mean the situation which you know uh, noted also, yes, when, when people, uh, well, go to the church in the morning and to, to the, the ancestor spirit skull, uh, uh, shrines in the evening, yeah? Of course, I met uh, a lot of such people in uh, uh, Uganda and also in Tanzania, for example. But at the same time, I met uh, not so few people who strongly opposed this uh, being well, really devoted Christians. And I think this is a, there is some tension uh, in society along these lines. And uh, once again, referring to your film, well, uh, the impression I got from, from the film, maybe I am wrong, but this is my impression, is that you wanted to say uh, that uh, despite all the changes and despite all the variety of religions, which, uh, uh, even more numerous that you could show in one film. Uh, well, uh, that despite all this, the Ugandan society, uh, in a kind, uh, in a sense, sorry, in a sense, uh, remains traditional. That despite all these, uh, well, shifts of uh, layers of different religions and cultures they brought, well, uh, the main religion in it is still, uh, well, uh, the ancestor cult and other traditional cults. Well, uh, you know, well, uh, this is, uh, as I see it, just one, one part of the story. And the second part, as I see, uh, is that, you know, while working, uh, doing fieldwork, 
among a, religious, a small religious group in Uganda. Well, I uh, thought uh, that uh, we uh, here, I think outside Africa, being non-Africans, well, uh, I used to divide religions in Africa into what, what are roughly called traditional religions, African religions in the proper sense, and well, the religions brought to them uh, from the outside, Islam and different branches of Christianity first and foremost. But uh, as I felt for many people uh, there with whom I communicated, the division was a bit different. Uh, as I said, I worked among uh, people who belong to a new branch, new for them branch, of course, or, or, or Russian old believers. And uh, as I said, many, almost all of them converted to it from other religions. Well, uh, mainly other Christian denominations. And in their view, for them, uh, people of the 21st centuries, although, well, Christianity and Islam uh, do not have so deep roots in that area uh, as they have, for example, in West Africa, right? For them, this is a kind of traditional religions. They perceive uh, Anglic Anglicanism, uh, Protestant, uh, sorry, uh, Catholicism and Islam as a, a kind of their, of their religions, a kind of their tradition already. Because in any case, they are there for more than a century and a half by now. Uh, and many of, uh, of those people with whom I communicated, they were dissatisfied with them because they do not feel they appeal uh, properly. Uh, they do not feel uh, any, um, a, a, any uh, anything what could appeal uh, their souls in these religions, they are too traditional for them already. They are seeking for something new. And uh, uh, some of them find this new, uh, this novelty in the, uh, in the born again, uh, in the born again church, uh, well, very modernistic. And while those with whom I communicated find it in the most conservative branch of Christianity, well, Russian uh, old believers, uh, well, claiming that this is the true Christian, the, the, the truest Christianity ever possible because they claim for keeping the most uh, initial, the initial Christian tradition. So uh, that's it. So I, I think that uh, the, the situation is much more complicated than we could, uh, you, than you could show in one film and we could discuss during one uh, seminar. Well, probably you are right. Uh, Sorry. Yes, Ludemir. I, I didn't see the film, but uh, but I think I think that this this distinction you just made, uh, Professor uh, Penicini, um, between uh, conversion and integration is extremely significant to understand the, the, the reality. Uh, a conversion uh, to me is uh, associated with uh, uh, colonialism and imposition of power and uh, some uh, major uh, uh, changes, cultural changes, whereas uh, the integration uh, gives agency to the people. It, it uh, elevates the, the people to those who choose, who have a choice um, to accept the, the new, what Dimitri was talking about, the new, the novelty, and turn it, the, this new, into their own. So, so, so uh, this this integration is is a, a sort of peaceful coexistence, as uh, some of the anthropologists I know discussed for many years, uh, and it makes more sense to me, especially because again, it it, it gives people the agency; they become agent. Of, of the change and not just subject to the change. So that, that what, what, what is really interesting to me uh, uh, here. But sorry, I couldn't see the film. Time difference, I am in a very different time zone than uh, you are in Europe. So uh, that is the reason. Yes, Cecilia, would, 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 Cecilia, would you like to uh, comment? Yes, uh, yes. No, it, the, the 
concept of agency, I think, is very, very right in this context. And uh, uh, it, it uh, captures well uh, this capacity of reinterpretation of, of, of what uh, was imposed, because it is true that the colony was an imposition. But I think that somehow they managed to reinterpret what was imposed to them in a very creative way, somehow also without declaring what they were doing, you know, but uh, con um, maintaining a, a relationship with the past. Uh, I know, Dimitri, you were right. The, the film is probably is very partial, but I, um, I don't know. I, I'm also, I'm always very impressed uh, by the connection with the past, uh, which is quite uh, alive uh, in in today Africa. The relationship with the ancestor, with ancestral lineages which is still very, very important. Uh, but at the same time, there are frictions. And the Pentecostals probably are the most uh, strong uh, opponents to the spirituality of the past. You know? the, the slogan of the Pentecostal is to make a complete, complete break with the past. And when you born again in Jesus, you must cancel everything. And they are also violent. Uh, in, in Uganda, there were episodes of violence. They burned the shrine. So what the Catholic and the Protestant did not do, the Pentecostals now, they are trying to, to do, really to try to break. But somehow, for me, it seems impossible because uh, it's as the, the life of the individual is still very much connected to the ancestral lines. Uh, That's true. It's my experience of, of my friends, of the, the people who I, uh, with whom I live in, in Africa. So, yes. That's true. And uh, in, in my view, the importance of the ancestor cult in Africa goes far beyond the cult as such, the cult itself. Uh -huh. Because in my view, this is the background of the African culture or cultures. Well, in the same sense and to the same degree uh, to which, in which, uh, for example, Christianity uh, is the background of the European cultures. Today, well, most European cultures are highly secularized. Well, and uh, despite all that, well, the, well, religion can um, be, can become less influential in society, but the culture formed uh, under its direct influence, which have been forming for uh, in Europe for two thousand years, right, uh, cannot uh, cannot avoid uh, being influenced by it uh, in the in the process of formation. And today we inherit uh, the uh, well the Christian culture pr probably in its secularized version or even atheistic version. And the same is true uh, for Africa, in my view. Even when uh, the ancestor cult uh, does not uh, form the background for social institutions, uh, is not uh, performed by many people. The, very African, the African culture as such is rooted in it, in the worldview it has produced and has been producing for thousands of years, actually. I agree. <laughs> okay, dear colleagues, any other questions, comments, suggestions? Okay, then, well, uh, I think our today's seminar was very productive. I am very grateful. First of all, to Cecilia and to all those who took part in it. I'm very grateful to Damir for his uh, uh, comments, observations. Well, and we'll see each other tomorrow, the same time. Well, uh, uh, have a nice day or evening, whatever each of us will have now.
Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. See you all. Bye. All of you. See you tomorrow then. See you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.